this is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. As today, we are previewing the Charles Schwab Challenge as the PGA Tour is back from its COVID-19 layoff. We're going to discuss that with Brandon Gadula, my co-host over at the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, talking about his betting simulations and his process for betting on golf. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always. Always by Ed Feng. You can find his work at thepowerrank.com. Ed, another sport coming back this week. We've already had UFC. We've had uh, yep. NASCAR. We've had Bundesliga, EPL, just around the corner. But golf this week, it's starting to feel like things not back to normal, but getting closer at least. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a reason why? I mean, it feels like golf maybe could have been one of the first to come back, given the nature of the sport. Was there a reason it didn't come back I, earlier? Or? I don't know. Um I think – I was thinking – we were talking about that too. Uh, I mean, when we were talking about golf or with Brandon earlier this week, like we don't really know why because NASCAR has more person-to-person interaction than golf does sure. because you have the pit crews. And sure. so if NASCAR can be back – and they've been back successfully. They've done the temperature checks. They've had – and there are more people at a NASCAR event too. Right. You would think that golf would be able to do so as well. Sure. I, like it, it, I can't criticize them because like I'm always on board with being cautious during, during a pandemic, but I agree. It's like kind of, it's interesting that it took this long, I guess. Yeah. I mean the state of Michigan, I mean, they allowed people to go play golf. Yeah. I mean, maybe like a month ago, Illinois and, did like at, I almost at the end of April or early May, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like an, a sport in which you can socially distance, but that obscures the bigger point in that we're getting back to normal uh, just yeah. a little bit. Here in the state of Michigan, restaurants have opened up this week, so we may venture out and take advantage of that uh, sometimes. So yeah, it feels kind of nice. It's nice because right? like you know, getting outside, you can get like the get some you know just you can see human beings even if it's from a distance. Like oh wow, like there are other humans on this here planet that I yeah. can see physically, yeah. and it's it's just nice to like have. I know I'm wearing yeah. like a mask and stuff, but like. I'd rather wear a mask and be allowed to go in public than right. be stuck in my house all day. So. Yeah. Did you but did you end up going to that protest in Syracuse that you posted on, yeah. on Twitter? Uh, so I went and I wore a mask and I didn't see hardly anyone who wasn't wearing a mask. Uh, right. So it actually was like surprising, honestly, that it, that it worked that way. We were able to like, I was there with my sister and her husband and then our neighbors and None of us even got like super close to anybody. Um, but like right. when you see like the aerial shots, it looks like it's people yeah. on top of people and you can't see the masks either. So it was yeah. interesting. Yeah. And it's also interesting because, I mean, there's been some positive tests with football players yeah. around the nation uh, and obviously college football. I mean, I fully expect the NFL to be back, but college football is a big variable. And I think there was a player from Oklahoma State that said, you know, he, he got it probably from one of these protests so as much precaution as you can take right you know there's still a risk going on and uh yeah just a lot of questions with college football i have no idea i i just you know it's hard to know i mean i think yeah. we can be very optimistic because these kids are getting back on campus which is sooner than i thought they would and uh so yeah we want to be optimistic but still a lot of uncertainty and uh the other downside i guess like the other thing too is like when you wear a mask you're not protecting yourself you're protecting others so like you're still at risk even if you're wearing a mask the other thing too is i had a wicked tan line from my mask <laughs> um because i kind of forgot to be fully honest to like put sunscreen on <laughs> because it's been a while since i've been outside yeah. so like i had like this really bad tan line like at the top of my nose where you could just see immediately where the mask ended I kind of dig it. It looks really weird, but like, I'm like, whatever. I mean, who cares? No one's going to see it because I'm not going out. Then I forgot that I had video work, uh, but yeah, can't you can't see really see it. Yeah. Yeah. So it wound up being okay. Uh, but that was a, a surprising side effect of it. Uh, but you know, it was worth it for sure. Yeah. All right, uh, we are going to get to Brandon in just a bit. And as mentioned, Brandon is the managing editor of Number Fire. Find him on Twitter at Gadula13. He is uh, the host of our DFS podcast here, the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast. We're going to talk with him about golf betting, how to utilize stats when betting on golf, his win simulations, and golfers he likes 
for this weekend's Charles Schwab Challenge. If you are looking for some EPL talk, we also had Austin Cass on last week to discuss betting on soccer, uh, some implications of the EPL. I know FanDuel Sportsbook has some additional EPL markets posted now, so you can check out what Austin said by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, the Google Play Store, you name it, you can find us there. And if you like what you hear, please leave a rating and review as well. Before we get to Brandon, though, we have to go back to last week because my Covering the Future discussed some NASCAR And the model was good, my bet was not. So we'll go through that first. Covering the past. All right, so last week here on Covering the Spread, I had discussed the NASCAR Cup Series race in Atlanta. And I mentioned that my model thought that Kevin Harvick was like outlierishly good. And I was like intrigued by that. I thought that he was in play at plus 460. But my thought process was I'm not going to bet that because we have limited information with no practice. Uh, things like that, and I was a chicken and decided not to bet Kevin Harvick. You will be shocked to learn that Kevin Harvick won the race in pretty dominant fashion. So the model was good, but I was like, nah, we can't go with the short guy. Let's go Joey Logano, who was second in the model, and he was 9-1. to one. And Logano did lead laps early on. He had a really good car. Uh, I thought that he was going to contend, at least push Harvick for a win. But then he got hit on pit lane. Uh, not his fault. Car never recovered, so Logano didn't win. Harvick did, so the model, I guess, was right, uh, but I didn't believe it enough to bet Harvick at, at such a low number. So, Ed, I'm at least encouraged that the model was good, uh, yeah. but, like, you know, just another another tough NASCAR bet once again. Yeah, I mean, it's always tough with, like, I mean, with the, such long odds on, on those guys, even the top guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think things like that are going to happen. Yep. Uh, We're going to try it again this week, though. So we'll talk about that in Covering the Future later on, and we will discuss that in a bit. But first, got to get to Brandon Gadula. And speaking of Brandon and the PGA, the PGA is back in a big way this weekend with a massive daily fantasy contest on FanDuel. This week's Mega Eagle contest includes $1 million in total prizes, with first place netting $100,000. Best of all, it's only $7 to enter. To get yourself a chance at all that cash and turning $7 into 100,000, go to FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app. Eligibility restrictions apply. Let's bring in Brandon Gadula now. Follow him on Twitter at Gadula13, the managing editor of Number Fire, and see what he likes this weekend at the Charles Schwab Challenge. Covering the present. Let's bring on Brandon Gadula to covering the spread as we get both of my podcast co-hosts to converge for the first time here. Brandon, welcome to the other podcast covering the spread. How are you doing today? I'm good. I, I get to see like the other side of Jim uh, with a with a different co-host. It's uh, I mean we've been doing it for years now, so yeah. uh, it's it's nice to like come on uh, covering the spread finally. Uh, but it's also nice to have golf back for real. Yeah. Are you jealous of Ed since, like, I'm? he's kind of, like, I mean, like, I also, I've talked to Austin Swain a couple of times. Like, I've had a couple of other co-hosts I've had to dabble with. So are you getting jealous yet? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, we had Tom Vecchio on to talk League yeah. of Legends. I mean, yeah. we, we started off uh, real small, and it was just you and me. And, I mean, you just spread your wings. And, I mean, you got so many different co-hosts. And, but I'm all right in the with dust. It. I just got to leave right you in the it. dust, man. That's, that's the big goal you here. You already have. Yeah, I mean, obviously, just, you know, leave you behind and go from there. But like you said, we do have golf back this week, which is pretty exciting because it's been about three months and it's been tough with no golf, uh, with things to track. What have you been doing to occupy your time? I know you're busy with work, obviously, but like from a sports perspective, what have you been tracking to kind of keep your brain occupied here? Well, I mean, f- there's really no off season when it comes to football. So building projections yeah. uh, with football. Studying up there, but I mean, when League of Legends is around, I'm a big uh, esports guy, so I've uh, been digging into League of Legends quite a bit. That's coming back. I mean, it is back, but yeah, uh, LEC is coming back. That's my that's my preferred one because it's on Fridays in the afternoon, like in, in the United States. So I get to kind of watch some sports during work uh, uh-huh. as opposed to kind of spending all my time after work working in sports all day watching sports. So uh, it's always nice to have that on in the background. Not that you would ever be distracted during work. Of course, that would that would never happen. Yeah, well, let's go with that one. Sure. Yeah. OK, so I will cover for you and we'll move on here and talk about this weekend's Charles Schwab challenge. And like we said, Brandon, there's been a long layoff between the most recent PGA event when they tried to do the players and had to scrap it. So we don't know what type of form everybody is in. 
Does that alter the way you are viewing the field from a betting perspective for this week? Yeah, it has to, but the way that it affects things is pretty much just guesswork. I mean, let's be real. We don't know. Uh, You can follow all the golfers you want on social media, but you can't really quantify what that means. You also can't track everyone. Uh, No matter if you look at everyone's social media feeds in the field, you're not going to know. Some guys post a lot. Some guys don't. We talked about this yesterday, but I mean, Xander Schauffele is my favorite golfer, and he's He's not super uh, active on social media. He's but the Brandon Gadula of the PGA Tour. Yeah, he just kind of does his thing, and you can't tell me that he's not out there uh, working on his game. He's a young guy, uh, no no family yet. So, I mean, he's got to be working on stuff but doesn't post. I mean, what do you do with that? Like, if you see someone out there posting all these rounds, posting all these highlights, you can think that he's working harder than anybody else, but you don't necessarily know. So I think really the, the real takeaway is – embrace some chaos in the short term uh golf's chaos in golf is already a big part of it um i will say that uh i did see a study on pga tour.com uh from dylan barney i think is how you pronounce it i believe he's irish i hope i don't get that wrong but i did some research sorry dylan but uh (laughs) actually uh he, he found that putting was actually the most stable stat after a long layoff which is Actually, not that surprising, I guess, because if you're not playing a lot of tournament golf, maybe your your ball striking's not quite there. But, you know, there's always an anecdote kind of against that. And we saw Justin Thomas return from his wrist injury, and we were like, well, you know, the putting's going to be there. It's just a matter of whenever the ball striking returns. He came back, his ball striking was on fire, and he couldn't putt because he, like, he said he overthought it and got too methodical. So, yeah, you have to adjust. You have to embrace for, you know, the layoff. But the way that you do it is not necessarily uh, very clear. Yeah. So, Brandon, let's little talk a little bit about your method uh, for predicting golf. Um, I'm interested in some of the factors that you consider. So how would you weigh something like current form versus, like, course history? So in terms of actually, like, my model, I don't look at course history at all. Uh, in terms of – and not everything I do is based on the modeling that I do uh, because golf right. is – Probably the sport where I would consider uh, the eye test to be more important than almost anything because Mm. some stats are still kind of in their infancy. You can miss a fairway by a few inches, and that's a missed fairway. But, I mean, uh, there are other ways that we can adjust for that. So uh, it's very difficult. But as as far as course history goes, I mean, I think there are just too many variables that we can't really account for the right way. You don't know if someone slept well the week entering that event last year, if they had family stuff going on behind the scenes and they miss a cut. That might sound a little dismissive, but I'll definitely take a larger sample anytime I can over a, you know, f- at, at best four round sample. So, you know, sure. even when we account for all that, uh, we don't always do a great job of adjusting for the f- current form when they had entering events. So if you, you know, happen to be, uh, you know, top 10 at, at a particular event, you might be in good form at that time of year based on your schedule uh, and how you train. You know, someone might have missed a cut at, at a course, you know, a, a few years in a row, but is that because he's just typically bad in the swing season? Is it more about the course fit? We don't really know. So uh, the way that I look at things is more uh, current form over course history. Of course, it's a little more problematic without that, that super current form uh, to dig into. <laughs> Um, and another with, another problem with uh, digging into you know course history is we can look at finishes too much, and it's not a terrible uh, way to look at things. But to finish top five, you almost always had a good putting performance. For example, sometimes it is elite tee to green and just lukewarm putting. But you know we're usually looking at outlierish performances unless it's like a superstar golfer. So I mean. You have to factor that in, uh, and I don't think we always do if we just look at finishing positions. And if you look at missed cuts, they're always treated badly, but you don't know if someone missed a cut unless you're digging into stuff and looking at more strokes gained, uh, actual scores. You know, you see three missed cuts, but someone could have missed the cut on the number three straight years but had really good ball striking at this course. And that was the, the missed cuts would make it seem like he struggles at the course, but maybe he just had three bad putting uh, experiences and – so I think I think course history is always very difficult to, to factor in the right way. 
I think that one interesting way to get around the course history aspect is by looking at different stats that fit well for the upcoming course. You know, you look at course fit rather than course performance. So what process do you use in order to decide which stats you want to emphasize in a given week so you can kind of predict how well a golfer will fit with that specific course? Yeah, so that's actually changed over the years for me, kind of changes week to week, really, based on what I find. Uh, I used to get, I used to try to be very methodical with it, uh, pulling like historical results, looking at correlations and R squared values. And generally, it's a, it's kind of a lukewarm relationship between predicting finishing position if you're looking at, at betting, because I know that you want to factor in strokes gain, but finishing position does matter. Um, you know, so it's usually kind of a, a a mild uh, relationship if you look at a large sample. So, I mean, that kind of deterred me from digging in in that in that sense. Uh, and as well, it's usually the same types of stats that that kind of uh, emerge as the most important, the most predictive. Strokes gained approach is always one. Strokes gained off the tee, greens and regulation, driving distance. So you have to factor that in that it's always kind of these similar uh, like stats and play styles for these guys who really separate themselves week to week. So for me now, what I do is I dig into my past notes uh, and kind of get some shortcuts there, which I know is not super actionable for listeners, but you can go to, uh, you know, any number of uh, sites and kind of get some, uh, you know, a little bit of shortcuts, whether it's number fire and the course primers that Mike Rodden does for us or going to datagolf.org. You can find things like course fit and historical results. Uh, They actually show you, the percentage of scoring dispersion at each course that's explained by off the tee play approach play around the green play and putting. So you can kind of see what's most important. And I mean, spoiler alert, it's always approach followed by <laughs> putting, uh, but putting is very hard to predict. So that's why approach is always uh, going to be touted as a, as a super vital stat. So, yeah, you know, I'll still look at like in tournament, in tournament uh, performances to see, Hey, if someone was hitting all the fairways, that's kind of, th- these are the types of players who actually separated themselves if you do that, just be be wary that uh, good putters are always going to be near the top because that's kind of the way that golf works. Um, so uh, there's no real process. I wish there was. I tried to have I tried to have that be the process. Um, but the way that golf works is there's never really one way to to make a birdie. Um, it can be a, a 40 foot putt. It can be sticking it to to six feet, uh, whatever it is. So. I, again, I used to get super uh, into things and try to figure out the the right way uh, to, to weigh things, but <clears throat> course fit only goes so far toward picking players. Brandon, I'm really interested in the simulations that you run to get the odds for every golfer to, to win a tournament. What goes into these simulations? Yeah, so uh, I kind of actually changed my, my, my model Um pretty substantially, but I'll go through what it used to be. And I, I still kind of averaging things out, um, to, to see which one I like more, but, uh, what I used to do, uh, and still am doing, but my initial, uh, process was, uh, pulling round by round scores. Uh, so not st- any stats, but just scores. Um, and then using the official world golf rankings, uh, field strengths, data golf's field strengths, you can kind of tweak uh, different events across different tours. So really what I wanted to see was uh, how does a PGA tour event compare to a corn Ferry tour or a European tour event? Uh, mainly because it seems like sometimes if there's a, like a phenom on the European tour who comes over uh, to the States to play in a PGA tour event, we look at like a string of top tens or top fives, but really if you kind of factor things in the right way, it's not necessarily more impressive all the time, like depending on the fields, it's not necessarily more impressive than a string of top tens on the corn Ferry tour. And we don't always give those players a ton of weight. So I wanted to adjust. Uh, so basically I'd get adjusted stroke averages for golfers, uh, across those three top tours, then use their round by round variants, uh, to simulate out events that accounted for, you know, specific individual golfer variants. And it worked well. Uh, but now I'm transitioning more to a model that, uh, relies on, Strokes gain tee to green and strokes gain putting because, as I alluded to before, I mean, anyone who deals with golf a lot knows that uh, putting is hugely important, but it's not necessarily consistent. Tee to green, though, is hugely important as well, uh, and it's more consistent. So I kind of wanted to adjust for uh, that knowledge that I have, uh, that we all kind of have. Uh, And really with the old model, uh, I didn't really have a a way to separate or lessen unless it was super subjective uh, golfers who are boosted by their putting. Uh, so for now, like I said, I'm kind of averaging out both of those models, but 
Uh, the important thing to keep in mind, uh, kind of what I was talking about with digging into the course fit, is the purpose that the purpose of a golf model to me isn't to run simulations and find the winner for that week. The golf, your golf model is not really going to tell you that Patrick Reed is going to win the WGC Mexico or that Sebastian Munoz is going to win the Sanderson farms. Instead, it's more, if you run enough simulations and your data is right, it'll show you something like, you know, Hey, Patrick Reed won this thing 2% of the time, but is priced like he's going to win it 1.3% of the time. And that doesn't sound like it's huge, but in golf, you you don't really get uh, spots where, hey, th- this golfer is five percentage points more likely to win than the betting line suggests. Because really, uh, whether you look at betting odds or any simulations you can find, the best golfers kind of max out at around 15% in win odds. Uh, someone like Rory uh, rarely gets past even 15%. So it's more about finding those general discrepancies than it is getting a perfect model because yeah, it's great if you hit Cam Smith to win the Sony Open over Justin Thomas, who actually missed the cut. But you don't really want your model to say, hey, I think Cam Smith's the better pick outright than Justin Thomas that week, because that's not really <laughs> what you want your model to say based on all the data we have. It's more uh, finding those leverage spots. So uh, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, yep. I think that it's uh, it's interesting, too, that you're changing it up because it seems like it was doing well before. Is it? Did you change it because you had the layoff and you had time to tinker, or what kind of led to you deciding to switch things up here? Um, it's partly that. It's mostly that uh, I didn't have a way to uh, give proper context to golfers who were generally boosted by putt or uh, were great tee to green. Um, and again, I mean, really, you can kind of make the case that what I was doing before was fine because you still have to make putts. Uh, As Jim knows, uh, some of our favorite golfers are golfers who are some of the best ball strikers and tee to green players in the world, but they don't putt well. And that really hinders their high end variance. So, again, for now, I'm still considering, you know, averaging them out, looking at what both spit out. But really, they're kind of similar um, because, again, uh, your your golf, your win odds for all. The, the vast majority of golfers is somewhere between like 0.8 and like one 1.2%, something like that. I mean, that's an oversimplification, but uh, you're not getting Rory McIlroy to win 30% of the time unless it's a super small, super weak field. You would think yeah. with all the putting practice byung Han has had, eventually you would catch. I mean, because when you get two or three putts per hole, you're hitting a lot of putts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you think I know. eventually I know turn around. From, yeah, I know that from firsthand experience. Yes, absolutely. And he is abundantly aware of this as well. So this week's event, Brandon, is at Colonial Country Club. Uh, It's obviously a unique course, as they all all are. But what makes Colonial Country Club unique? And how are you adjusting for that by looking at different golfers this weekend? Yeah, so the way that this course is laid out, uh, there's more of an emphasis on driving accuracy than distance, which is actually pretty uncommon. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of a, I won't say it's unique, but, uh, we generally put more emphasis on distance than we do on accuracy. So driving accuracy is getting more weight uh, than usual for me. Uh, but I mean, again, if you're, if you're new to golf betting, uh, and you can really only look to a few stats to start, uh, I think the key one this week and every week is just strokes gain approach or strokes gain T to green can't really go wrong. But, uh, one pitfall you can find is if you give too much weight to strokes gain T to green and off the tee, and approach, you're kind of looking at the same stats. Uh, same, same with strokes gained approach in greens and regulation. It's not the same stat, but it's a lot of the same statistics. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind. You can't really go wrong with just looking at the best tee to green golfers and guys who aren't terrible uh, with the putter. So that's the case for me this week uh, with approach getting the most value, uh, especially with these smaller guarded greens. I, I think that there's merit uh, to thinking about how the course will play without spectators this goes for this week and uh, you know the, a few weeks coming up these errant drives could get lost more easily uh rough around the green where spectators generally stand it's, it's not going to be you know tamped down some of these lies might be tougher so potentially uh prioritizing accuracy to stay out of trouble uh and then gre- uh greens and regulation or uh, also factoring in stroke skin around the green for guys who can get up and down uh, so it's kind of an all-around uh you know profile for me this week because it's also a tough field so you want golfers who kind of do everything uh so uh i would say approach driving accuracy greens and regulation uh kind of the big three for me yeah let's talk about some odds brandon um is there anything you like over at fanduel sportsbook uh based on your model 
Yeah, so so far yeah. this week, uh, my betting card has uh, featured Xander Schauffele. Shocker. Uh, Shocker. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's 33-1 to 1 on FanDuel Sportsbook right now. He has the all-around game uh, to contend. He's definitely not afraid of a tough field, which is one of those things that will show in the data if you look at it right and you adjust for field strength. But we also know what he does in majors and in these more difficult fields anyway. So uh, he's young. Uh, he's a grinder, and as Jim knows, he's my my favorite golfer. But I think it's a really solid pick uh, this week, especially at thirty three to one. Uh, everything kind of sets up for someone like Xander uh, to return and have everything sort of finely tuned about his game. Uh, he was really improving uh, with the short game. One of the best ball strikers, uh, you know, on the planet as it is. So I think Xander at thirty three to one uh, is a standout. I also have some stabs at Brooks Kepka who was in terrible form uh, entering uh, the hiatus, but he's 25 to one on FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, he's a, one of those plays where the stats just aren't there, but we know what the high end of his range of outcomes is. And uh, depending on how you look at things, you you sometimes might over or underestimate what it takes to win a, a golf event. And I think sometimes we get you know excited on some of these golfers who can finish top 10, but can they really actually hit that outlier performance it takes to win a PGA Tour event? We know Brooks Kepka can. So uh, for the price, I think Brooks is worth a uh, bounce back shot. And then I have a few more youngsters, uh, I think, that stand out on uh, FanDuel Sportsbook. Colin Morikawa at 45 to 1, Victor Hovland at 65 to 1, and Joaquin Neiman at 85 to 1. These guys all fit that uh, world class ball striking mold with some short game issues. They're all young enough where this time off might help them uh, figure things out. So, and Joaquin Neiman's back on bank grass, so so uh, we can always uh, play that angle. And then uh, Billy Horschel, uh, someone also who is kind of, you know, uh, interesting to me. So I might be a little out over my skis with all these names. I, I get that, but it's it's hard not to be excited the first week back. And if you're betting golf uh, and you want a lot of plays. None of these guys are super pricey. It's not like we're betting. It's not like it's Rory, Rom, JT. That's not really uh, how you want to start your betting card. Yeah, I think with the longer with the longer odds, it's it's acceptable to bet more than one. Obviously, I want to go back to Brooks though because he's really interesting because there were several golfers who were just really bad short term form before the layoff. Uh, you have Brooks Kepka, Dustin Johnson, Justin Rose, all at least at least to a certain extent in that mold. Are you looking at those guys for this week with the long layoff, seeing if they've made corrections? Or was it just Brooks specifically that got you interested? I think it's mostly Brooks. Uh, I think that there's probably any, almost any angle this week is justifiable uh, to think if you see something. And again, uh, I'm usually much more methodical uh, with sports than, than I am with golf because golf just kind of is that sport where – you know, we, it takes an outlier performance to win. Uh, we know from studying golf over the years that it's not like we can feel super confident in any specific play. Favorites can miss the cut. So it's more about Brooks uh, getting some time off. Uh, and we joked about this on the heat check, but the time off might be great for Brooks uh, to, to, to kind of figure things out. But he also doesn't like to practice. Right. So he could miss the cut, which is very much in the realm of uh, possibilities for him. Uh, but it's just uh, jumping back on Brooks, I think, uh, before everyone else does and getting him at, you know, around 25 to one. Uh, it's, it's probably too long for someone of Brooks Kepka's caliber. Yeah, the negative side of the variance, not a bad thing. Uh, as long as they can hit the top end of the variance too, and we know Brooks can do that. So I think that that makes a lot of sense. And if, uh, go ahead. And if you're if you're betting outright winners, doesn't matter if you miss the cut or finish exactly. the second. You want them Just to win. Scrub your hands, put in some round three bets, and move on. <laughs> They've also got a bunch of other markets posted at FanDuel Sportsbook because this is the uh, the first match back. So they got round leaders, top fives, top tens. Head-to-heads, any of those numbers stick out to you as being advantageous for the Charles Schwab? So historically, I have not been great with head-to-heads. Um, I don't know what it is. I think it's probably because I looked to, uh, to find too much value as opposed to just picking the, the golfer who's uh, the, the better golfer, uh, the more likely to, to, to finish better. But I'm going to stick with my usual process. I like John Rahm against Rory McIlroy, uh, which is scary to go against Rory at, at, at all. But uh, Rahm is plus 116 on FanDuel Sportsbook and that head-to-head. That's actually right in line with where I have it uh, in all my simulations. So 
Uh, I think Rom uh, makes sense whenever you can get uh, you know th- those type of odds on someone as good as John Rom, who's really to me the only golfer in the same kind of atmosphere as Rory right now. As far as some top tens, I like Victor Hovland uh, at plus seven hundred. He's actually one of the golfers who sticks out to me the most. Uh, we we already sort of talked about it. You need golfers to hit the high end of their variance, and Victor Hovland's very cons- or had been very consistent. His standard deviation and round round scoring was one of the lowest that I've tracked over the past like two years. That's great, but it's not necessarily great if you're looking for outright winners. So I me- I know I mentioned Hovland uh, at I think sixty five to one, but top 10 he's he's, uh you know plus 700 so i think that makes sense billy horschel as well a golfer who has been very consistent over a pretty large sample now uh he's plus 750 i like him as a top 10 as well and someone like adam hadwin is uh plus 1000 uh he's very consistent fits seems to fit the course well uh with the accuracy uh and then there's actually an odds boost um between uh rory rom and justin thomas that's plus 375 to win Uh, i like that by a few percentage points so uh, it might not be bad to top on that and just have one of the favorites and, and not really worry about which one it is. Uh, so I think that makes sense on FanDuel Sportsbook as well. Yeah, with Rory and Rom being as short as they are and adding JT on top of that, I, I can see why that would be intriguing as well. That is Brandon Gadula. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Gadula13 and check out his simulations over at numberfire.com. Also has uh, other daily fantasy stuff up there. And check out our podcast if you want to play some DFS, the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. Brandon, thanks for swinging by. Appreciate it and enjoy the golf this week. Thanks for having me, guys. It was a pleasure. Covering the future. One final thank you to Brandon Gadula for swinging by and talking about golf for this weekend. And Ed, uh, it was nice to get to hear you talk with Brandon about betting models because, I mean, both of you have like your own numbers and stuff. And it must be like, I have it for NASCAR too, but it's the only sport where I have it. So, it, but it must be satisfying for you to put in all these inputs and then get like an actual like tangible product out of it that you can look at. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I always think it's it's cool when Brandon d- d- <clears throat> does the model, you know, improves upon the model, and uh, and that was interesting hearing about how he's kind of got two different ways of doing the simulations now based on different inputs, and and yeah, I mean, that's definitely the way to go. Um, and then write about it and talk about it. I, I think that's pretty awesome. So it was really nice to to hear him talk about that, and uh, I look forward to to reading more about it. And for people who didn't listen, maybe we've gained new listeners since the fall. You have a similar approach with college football, correct? Where you have multiple different models you can look at uh, to decide where you may have some betting value? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> so all my best models are a combination of models from that use different data sources. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the, the machine learning people have known that ensembles of models, so basically <laughs> combining the predictions of strong models together will give you an even stronger model. Uh, I, you don't really want to put something weak in there, but if you have a number of good data sources, uh, the combination of those things ends up being pretty powerful. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's how I go about my business. Hopefully we'll get to discuss those models this fall. We shall see yeah. for sure. <laughs> well, we'll Let's, yeah. I'm pretty confident we will for the NFL. So Yeah, at least we'll get that. We'll, 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 we'll hold see. on to that. To be determined about college. Let's move now into covering the future, Ed. We've been discussing Bundesliga and compiling some data on the Bundesliga as the sample expands. You said you were crunching some of the numbers for the Bundesliga. What do those numbers say about the return to play so far? Yeah, so first I just want to thank Austin from last week for yep. pointing me to, to FB reference. If you guys don't know, like the sports reference sites are one of your best resources for getting data on whatever you might need. So it starts with profootballreference.com. Actually, I think it, they started with baseballreference.com. And uh, a lot of, you know, if I need some NBA numbers, I will go there and, and look at that. And um, anyways, a great reference. So, you know, when Austin last week mentioned that FB reference has expected goals like I got really interested in that and so they actually have expected goals for the last two years and then this season as well as results and and other things for the Bundesliga so it actually allowed me to kind of get a little bit more complete of a picture of home field advantage something I've been talking about home field advantage was 0.4 goals the last two seasons um 
the thing I hadn't told you guys about is like what happened before the pandemic this year. And that home field advantage was down to 0.23. So significantly lower than, uh, you know, what it had been uh, in the past couple seasons. So, you know, these things tend to be really random in the NFL this year. Road team scored more points than the home team, uh, which was definitely a fluke. We don't expect that at all, except we might expect it this upcoming season because there won't be any fans. <laughs> so, so anyways, uh, so in the Bundesliga last season, 0.4 goals. Usually it was 0.23, and now we're at negative 0.4 goals per match for so the actually advantage for the away team at this point. So, anyways. The I think the I don't think we can say there's a road advantage at all. So I'm just assuming these are all neutral sites. Uh, I don't think that's completely correct, but I think home field advantage is so minimal that I'm just not going to worry about it right now. So you can go to Football Reference. Uh, I took the scores and I looked at adjusted goals, and then I can adjust for strength of schedule with the methods that I have. And you get rankings for teams and then predictions for some games. And let's just go through two just quick insights from them. Um, Bayern Munich is the best team. Uh, in the table, and they're the best team by these uh, expected goals as well. Um, in the table, uh, Dortmund is ahead of Leipzig at three, but they're actually flipped when you look at uh, this analysis based on adjusted expected goals. So Leipzig is better. Um, uh, in the actual table, you know, Dortmund's ahead uh, by four points, and Leipzig uh, allowed a, like a 90th minute goal to the worst team in the Bundesliga to, to get a tie this weekend. So they essentially dropped two points in a very uh, bad fashion this weekend. So, so there are four points down there. But the numbers overall for the season like them better than Dortmund. And then the other thing that I was looking at that I found interesting is, is that Bayern host uh, Mönchengladbach this weekend. And uh, the odds actually like Mönchengladbach uh, in this game. So my odds give him about a 17% chance to win. This is not high. But it does suggest that there's some value at plus 700. Um, the markets are strongly in favor of Bayern Munich. And we definitely expect Bayern Munich to win this game. But the one thing is that they will not have two of their best players. Uh, their best player is Robert Lewandowski. He is their goal scorer. He is maybe the one of the best goal scorers in the world. And anytime you miss him, um, uh, you, you're going to be missing someone. And they're also missing Thomas Mueller, who's another one of their, their key attacking players. So those odds look interesting. I'm not quite ready to... Uh, I'm still thinking about whether to put some money down on it, but it is uh, is a game I'm looking for. I'm, it's a game I'm looking at in relation to these new numbers. Well, and like Brandon said, like, you know, you're not going to get Munchen, Munchen Gladbach. Is that how you say it? M- Munchen Gladbach. Gladbach, okay. I wrote it down I, phonetically I on That's my great. sheet, so I just I put it down. I don't have no idea why I'm telling you if that's right or not. I don't know. But <laughs> you, if you want to look it up, you'll know what team we're talking about. They're right, playing, exactly. So. Uh, but, like, we're not – the numbers aren't going to say ever that they're going to win outright against Bayern Munich. And if they do, your numbers probably suck. But you're just finding oh. value. And 17% versus 12.5% or whatever the implied odds are of plus 700, right. that's good. You'll definitely take that. Like, that's that's – expect plus expected value so uh i'm glad that you have these numbers now i'm pretty excited about that any thought to you on publishing those on the power rank or yeah more so tinkering around i mean i was uh i was more <laughs> i i think i'm going to post them on the public part of my site okay um i mean i would be very cautious in using them i, I would not use only these numbers in, right. in making a bet um but i think it can be a resource uh i think i can make them better by next week but there's no harm in in uh, in you know putting it out there. I think with just all the caveats of this is something that new that I'm trying. Absolutely, I, I like that, and I look forward to seeing how things go. All right, so we got we got one down here for this weekend in the Bayern Munich match last weekend. I decided not to bet Kevin Harvick, even though he was first in my model. He was just right. too short, as you mentioned, for my liking. This week, Harvick is not first in my model, uh, but from a value perspective. I think he is the best bet on the board. So we are going to go Kevin Harvick this week for nice. covering the future. Uh, the top two drivers in my model for this week are Joey Logano and Martin Truex Jr. Logano always grades out pretty well in my model. I don't know why. Uh, he's won two races this year, so I guess it's not a bad thing. But he's plus 950. And then Truex is plus 550 at FanDuel Sportsbook. I think both those numbers are fine, and I'd be interested in Logano for sure. But Harvick is third, and he is within a half position of both Logano and Truex, but Harvick's odds are somehow 12 to 1. 
That is the longest of anybody in the top seven of my model, and Harvick is all the way up in third. My best guess at why this is happening is that it's being driven by Harvick's history at Martinsville. He has just one win here. That was all the way back in 2011. So I wouldn't even factor that in, honestly, the fact that he won here back then. And he has not led a single lap in any of the past seven Martinsville races. But it's also not as if he's, like, non-competitive here. He has five straight top tens. Uh, he has a pair of top fives. And he had a seventh-place average running position in last year's spring race. And when you pair that decent track history with how good Harvick has been this year— it's really hard for me to see why he would be all the way down at 12 to 1. So I like Harvick quite a bit. I was going to mention William Byron as someone you could bet. Uh, he was 42 to 1 when I was doing my notes. He is no longer 42 to 1. He is 30 to 1. So it's probably a bit too short for my liking now. Uh, but if you find William Byron at longer than 30 to 1, I could go in there. Uh, but otherwise, I think Harvick and Logano, my two favorite guys on the top end. Uh, for this weekend. Logano plus 950, again, always seems to pop my model. And then Harvick is 12 to 1. So the main two guys for me for Martinsville this weekend. And we talked about, you know, track history. Uh, we talked about course history with Brandon. Right. I would say this is one race where I'd be more willing to do course history versus or, or track history versus current form, just because there aren't a lot of recent relevant races. Like, Martinsville is unique because it is shaped like a paperclip. It is very, it is very flat. It is very, very, uh, very slow. And there haven't been a lot of tracks like that. So looking back to last year, my model did favor track history quite a bit more so than it usually does. So that would be an argument against Harvick, given that his track history is not like elite, but okay. I'm still going to go there regardless. I do okay. like being able to look back and back test things. I think it's pretty fun. Yeah, for sure. And so, so what you're saying is, you know, Harvick was first in your model last week because of track history, and then that is the factor that's bumping him down this week. Correct. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And, like, he was he was also first because of current form last week. Um, like, he, he was just, like, elite. Like, he was all around really good. It was right. actually, like, the eighth best mark my model has had. Um, and, it, and it's hard to get that, that good of a number without practice, which shows you I should have had more confidence in him. But, alas, you know, we live and we learn, and hopefully he can uh, do it again once again this week. Ed, what you got going on over at the Power Rank and on the Football Analytics Show? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I will post some soccer numbers, uh, maybe get some EPL stuff up next week as well. Uh, and uh, still working on some long-term projects uh, for football. And But if you want to know about them, go to thepowerrank.com, sign up for my free email newsletter. Do you typically do EPL stuff? or Because I know you do like inter international soccer, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I've always done international soccer. I yeah. think that's an area where my methods really kind of stand out because yeah. strength of schedule adjustments are, I mean, just just huge when yeah. when you have uh, when you have just the the disparity in team strength that you do on the international level. That's less so in uh, you know in these top leagues. Although you know, I mean, with European soccer, there's a little bit more of uh, you know the the big teams like Bayern Munich that and the Man Cities that are always the that that are the best right now. Um, and I think part of it is like I've never run these numbers because a I've never had an easy data source like right. Paulson pointed out last week, and b like club soccer just kind of never fit into my sporting life until this pandemic. So uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I like it. So we'll see. Uh, it's just, um, you know, I think it's always good to get some diversity in, in what you're thinking about in terms of sports and betting. And so this is my venture to do that. I tried to do League of Legends and venture out that way. I ditched it pretty quickly. So hopefully uh, <laughs> your ventures into Bundesliga and EPL are, are more fruitful uh, for you. One final big thank you to Brandon Gadula at Gadula13 for swinging by. Talking some golf for today. Check out his simulations over at numberfire.com. Follow Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank and check out his website, thepowerrank.com. I am on Twitter at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you as well to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And, of course, thank you to everyone for tuning in for this week, for this episode of Covering the Spread. Good luck if you decide to dive into some golf or NASCAR bets, and we'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs>